Hey everybody, welcome to week five of Talking with God, Principles of Hearing God. Uh, this is week five, and we are in the eight C's of testing to, to see whether something is of God or not. Let's get started. So this week we have two more C's, uh, compare and crop. Last week we covered consistency. The first C is a consistent with the entire word of God. And character is a consistent with the character and person of God. And this week we have two more, compare and crop. Compare and crop. Compare to the teachings and person of Jesus. And what is the crop or fruit of what you're thinking of doing? Let's start by looking at compare first, our first C for this week. So under compare, there are some questions that we can ask. The main question is this. How does what you are feeling or hearing compare to the teachings and person of Jesus Christ? You can also ask, what would Jesus do? More importantly, what did Jesus do? What would Jesus say about my decision? How would Jesus handle it? Is another way to look at it or think about it. Is what I am hearing consistent with his person and teachings? And here's the key. You have to know your Bible to use this test. You have to know it. In one sense, the entire Bible, because Jesus is the Word. And all of Scripture is Jesus, the incarnate Word. And in another sense, the New Testament is more specifically where we have Jesus in person uh, teaching, and it's recorded in four different Gospels, so you obviously have to know those well. But if something you're thinking of feeling or doing, or you think it's from God, is uh, not consistent with Jesus' person or teaching, then it's probably almost certainly not from God. So let's look at this a little bit more carefully from some of the verses that we had this week. The first verse is in John chapter 7. This is an important verse because it deals with the will. Let's read it. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, then he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now, the reason this is important is right here. I have it underlined and highlighted for you. Look what it says. Then he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it's from God. This is what we're after. We're trying to figure out is something from God or not. And Jesus tells us that we will know if something's from God if, if what? It's right before it in verse 17. This is an if-then statement. If anyone wills to do his will. Look at it there. We have, if anyone wills to do his will, that's the if, then you'll know if something's from God or not. In verse 17. So the question is, well, what is the will? What is the issue? It's willing to do the will of the Father. The person is, is willing to do that. You, your, your will is to do the will of the Father. And well, what is the will? Well, it's a desire and intent to know and do God's will. Your will is your volitional choice. You are, you are desiring uh, to do something. You are wanting to do something. You're choosing to do something. And that's your intent. In this case, it's the will of God. It's actively seeking to know God's will in order to do it and obey it. Because, look at this question. Do you really want to know God's will to obey it? Or do you want God to give you the answer you are wanting? One's unconditional and the other's conditional. Because what Jesus is talking about as a person, their will is to do God's will. They don't need to know what it is. They're going to do it. They're not waiting to see what God says and then decide if they'll do it. They're willing to do his will, just like Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Okay, so it's our will that's the issue. The problem is with us. So examine your will. Is this your will? Um, is it your will to do his will unconditionally? That's the key. A few more things here. Look what he says that you need to seek his will with your will, which is a heart or intent issue, right? So we're just unpacking this a little bit more, more uh, in a detailed way. You need to be seeking his will 
with your will, which is an issue and intent of the heart. Now, how do you do this? Well, prayer, surrender, worship, and the word. You talk to God, you pray to him, you worship him, you get in his word, and you go after his will and ask him for it. And all of these together, remember, these are all the components of the relationship in our relationship diagram. Another way to think about it is being all about God and what he wants to do and say. Being all about God and what he wants to do or say. He's your life. He's your purpose. He's what you are about. Now, there's something else here in verse 18. Let's look at that. Look what he says here. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. This is important because obviously this is related to the will and knowing uh, if something is of God or not. Because right after he talks about the will, then he talks about what kind of glory you're seeking. So the question you need to ask yourself, are you seeking to glorify self or God? Because this is obviously, obviously related to seeking the will of God or your self will. And this is going to affect your hearing. And so where does self glory come from? Uh, seeking your own glory? It comes from the flesh, which we know needs to die. So what you're seeking is related to your will. One person is seeking the will of God, which is um, to his glory, because you're accomplishing his will. Jesus said, you know, I have accomplished your will. I've glorified you here on earth. Another person is seeking their own glory and their own will. So you can get at your will by looking for what the glory is. And you can be doing Christian things, Christian service, and be seeking your own glory. So be careful. Now, here's our diagram that I've given you last week about knowing the will of God. And the key that we want to talk about is we just said that the flesh needs to die because it's the source of, um, of the will. Uh, it, it's the source of our own will. And so here we have uh, in our diagram, you can see again, this part for this week relates back to our relationship diagram, Romans 12, 1 to 2, putting yourself up on the altar and dying, because now you're giving up your will, you're putting the flesh to death, and you're seeking the will of God and surrender. And there we have... Um, uh, uh, the verse in the little heart there from John 7, 16 to 18. That's how it fits into our uh, relationship diagram because everything that we're doing pretty much fits in here. Now, there's another verse we need to look at from 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 5. We studied this this week. Look what this one says. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness... That's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about comparing uh, things to the teachings and person of Jesus and his doctrine. And that's what is mentioned here in 1 Timothy. And it says that if anyone teaches otherwise to this, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. So let's look at this a little more carefully. This is what we're homing in on, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we're talking about comparing ourselves to him and his teaching, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Well, what is godliness? Godliness in the Greek is the word eusebia. And uh, a simple way to think about it is to be all about God and his will in your life to be all about God and his will in your life. Or maybe a little more detailed would be respect, honor, reverent fear, and dedication that affects the way a person lives. It's affecting the way that you live. It's a God mindset, a God respect, a God consciousness, and it's affecting your living at all times. Or maybe understanding who God is, what he has done, and what he is doing with a heart to obey him. And so ask yourself, will this make me godly or ungodly? Will this help others to be more or less godly? Uh, that's how you can use godliness as a test. 
Uh, it's not applicable to every situation. It may not always apply, but you should think about this uh, when you're trying to discern if something's the will of God for you or not. And this could be even the things that you say or do. Uh, things that you say or do can make you more or less godly. So let's move on now to crop. Crop. And what we're talking about here is the fruit. What is the fruit of uh, what you're going to do? And in uh, your book, there are a list of questions. And these are great questions. You're going to get a summary diagram of all the eight C's that you can keep, maybe even laminate. So when you're facing a decision, you can run through these and have them quickly available to know and help you examine this aspect of discerning the will of God for crops. So let's look at them. The main question here, which is related to all the others, is what will be the fruit or result of your actions of what you're thinking of doing that God's telling you to do or God wants you to do? Does it promote spiritual health and godly living or weakness and ungodly selfish living? Does it glorify God and promote his kingdom or glorify you and promote your kingdom? And be very careful here because many people deceive themselves and think that they're doing something for God and promoting his kingdom when all they're after is attention and self-glory and promoting their kingdom. Does it make you and others more like Jesus or the world? Does it bring you or others closer to God or further away? What is the effect on the heart and the spirit? What are your motives? This is a tricky one. We often aren't honest about our motives. You need to pray and ask God to show you your real motives. What am I really after? What am I really trying to do? Because um, this can be deceitful. We like to deceive ourselves. How about this one? How will it affect life at home, work, church, and society according to God's plans and priorities for you and others? That's the key. Uh, because some things can have a negative effect, but maybe in the big picture, it's for a time. Your job may be super demanding for a period of time, and you're not as home at much, but you know what? you got to pay the bills, and that's what God's given you, and you got to do it, and the family has to deal with it. But you have to look at everything in context. Does it involve idolatry or an idol in you or their life? Ooh, this is an ugly one. We could give a whole talk on idolatry, but uh, an idol is something that you're worshiping, giving worth to, and getting worth from. Uh, the word comes from uh, the word ido, uh, which means to give and receive worth. Um, that's what wor worship comes from, that word, worthship. You're giving something worth and receiving worth from it um, in place of God. Uh, so be careful. Is it characteristic of the flesh, sinful nature, or the Holy Spirit? And does it produce freedom or bondage? Is it producing freedom or bondage? These are great questions, and uh, you will have them uh, in summary. And they're in the back of your book, too, in the summary as well. So just talking about crop, one key verse here uh, is... He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So this whole principle of sowing and reaping is that whatever you're doing in life, uh, you're planting seeds. Everything you do and say is planting seeds. Uh, what you see, what you read, where you are, what goes into your heart and mind, what goes out into the world, right, your deeds, your words, uh, what you're doing with your kids, your work, uh, your church, uh, or others. We're always sowing uh, something. And um, this goes back to the principle of uh, there's the flesh versus the Holy Spirit, right? That's what this verse is talking about. And basically, which one you sow to more will be stronger and win. And uh, remember, you're living in a world you're living in the very last time of human history when man has done an uh, incredible job of making everything, everything about the flesh and self and make it seem nice, make it seem even Christian. So be really careful here 
because you have to really watch what you're sowing uh, into your life. Now, the types of fruit that you can get, we've looked at this, right? We have the fruit of the Spirit, which is what we want, love from the Holy Spirit. And then we have the fruit of the flesh, which is rotten fruit. Remember, that's uh, obvious. And then we have the plastic fruit, which is deceiving because it looks real. Let's look at this a little bit more carefully now because that's what we're looking at. We're fruit inspecting. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love or unselfish giving. All the other aspects, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, are aspects of unselfishness. It's like the details of love. What does love look like? And that, that's it. So really the fruit is love. The fruit, the rotten fruit is murder, selfish taking. If love is unselfish giving, then rotten fruit is selfish taking. And plastic fruit, this is the ugly one. This is the one that's common in church. So be careful, is selfish giving. You're giving, but your motive is selfish. Remember we talked about the deceitfulness of motive? Well, you really have to look carefully at the motive for plastic fruit. So let's look at an example. We did this last week, but it's good to review. Kindness is an, a part of an aspect of love, and it's unselfish niceness. It's being nice, but with an unselfish motive. Now, the rotten fruit, remember, is obvious. It's easy to spot. It's less common because it's so obvious, right? Being cruel or callousness. That would be selfish cruelty. If kindness is unselfish, niceness, then this would be selfish cruelty. And here's the real tricky one. Um, look at what niceness is. It's selfish outward niceness. It has a motive. It's the whore of kindness. And it looks real, but it's not. So you really have to be careful. We're in a society that likes to talk about everyone being nice and everything's nice and they're so nice. Well, that's nice, right? Ha ha. But you need to know what the motive is because there's two kinds of niceness, unselfish niceness and selfish niceness. We're going to look at some examples here. But just a few more things about fruit that are very interesting. Um, think about real fruit a piece of fruit. Is it designed for itself? Is a banana made for itself? No, it's not designed for self-consumption. Fruit is not for itself, but for others. Uh, fruit is for someone else to eat it, not the fruit to eat it itself. And remember this, uh, my wife said this, even real fruit has imperfection. So don't, when you're fruit inspecting, ex expect perfection because we're all flawed. Okay, now look, let's look at the rotten fruit. Only rotten fruit eats itself, right? Uh, a fruit that is decaying uh, and rotten is eating itself, and that's rotten fruit, right? A true fruit doesn't eat itself. Uh, rotten fruit makes people sick. Now let's look at the plastic fruit. It's designed for show, isn't it? It's designed to look real when it's fake, and you have to look uh, carefully and up close to determine whether it's real fruit or not. You can't just tell from afar. You've got to almost touch it and look at it. So you really have to be careful here when trying to figure out what the fruit is. And it's dead, isn't it? It has no nutrients, plastic fruit. So this whole fruit thing, um, what I would say is that uh, you're going to encounter the plastic fruit a lot more uh, in terms of getting burned or deceived by it because it looks real when it's not. And again, this is the one that's common in church. There's a lot of uh, fake stuff going on um, in church these days, so be careful. Now, another word uh, in here, uh, back to our word godliness, is godliness is a means of gain. Let's look at this verse from 1 Timothy because it's related uh, to plastic fruit. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicions. 
useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourselves. So we looked at this verse, but we didn't look at this aspect of it. We saved it for here. Godliness is a means of gain. Hmm. So here, remember, godliness is that um, reverence, fear, and um, uh, uh, wanting to be all about God that affects your life. And here, uh, we're told in Scripture that, that this godliness can be used for selfish gain. So now we're getting into kind of uh, plastic fruit, aren't we? Something is godly or seemingly godly, but it's being twisted and used for selfish motives. So let's just look at a few simple examples. Here's two lunch dates, right? Everything seems nice in both situations. Again, our society is all about nice. I hear this all the time, how nice they are, and he's nice, and she's nice, right? But how do you know, right? They had two nice invitations to lunch from nice people. But here's the kicker, and you can't see it by looking at it, and in this situation, neither person knows which one it is. One has a selfish motive and one doesn't, right? One has a selfish motive here. One person is here with an agenda. Uh, they want something. They want to get something from someone. They want to get them to do it. They want to take something from them. And they're pretending to be nice. They're acting nice, but their heart is not nice. It's plastic fruit. And think about this. If you're taking someone to lunch who you know isn't a Christian with the motive uh, to help them uh, know the Lord, uh, is which scenario? Is it um, you are pretending a little bit, but your heart is right? So I would say that that's genuine. So here we have um, uh, niceness, selfish outward niceness. This man uh, is taking this man out to lunch, not because he likes him, not because he wants to be with him. He's not being a so-called nice to him because he cares about him or wants to know him. He has an agenda. He wants something from him. He wants a business deal. He wants to take something from him. He has a motive. And in this case, hey, this woman invited the woman out because she just wants to be with this person, to know them, spend time with them. That's unselfish niceness. Let's look at this. Here's a Christian Facebook page that a woman has made, and it has lots of good Christian things on it. It's a good, it's a good Facebook page, right? Now, let's look. Is this the will of God or an imagination of your own heart? Just because something is Christian does not mean that it's necessarily of God. It may not be against him, but it doesn't mean that it came from him. Remember our famous quote from A.W. Tozer who said that at the beginning of the church age, if you were to remove the Holy Spirit, 95% of all things would stop and everyone would notice. And if today, and he said this in 1960s, think about how much worse it is today, if you were to remove the Holy Spirit, 95% of all church activities would continue and nobody would notice, which means there's a lot of stuff going on in the church or Christian related that isn't from God. Crazy, but true. So here on this Facebook page, uh, is it really to glorify God or promote self? Um, is it love to help others or the pride of life? Um, is it pointing people to Jesus or to appear holy in front of people? So yes, you could have a website like this, but your motive is wrong. You want to be seen. You want everyone to know you. You want everyone to think of you as this Christian person and talking about you. You want all kinds of likes and all that. You're really, your intent is not for God. And you may be deceiving yourself here. Or how about this one? You have a new job idea. You've read an article about five super hit business ideas to start in 2023. I guess now it would be 2024. Um, so you want to start a new business. You have a great idea. Uh, do you need to test it? Yes. Oh, yes. Please remember this. You need to test it. Um, did your idea come from God or your own imagination? Did it come from careful prayer and listening? What is your motive? 
Is it money, power, position, recognition, self-worth, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life? Highly possible with any job because jobs have become idols. Or is it the will of God, a ministry opportunity to serve God or something that God's told you to do? So you really have to test and be honest. We're almost done. Now back to this idea of godliness being a means for gain. Look for motive. Who benefits and why? Um, and realize this, your benefit is not always wrong. God may lead you to do something, and uh, maybe it makes you a lot of money, but God led you to do it. You're tithing, you're using it to, for God's glory as best you can. So being blessed, being benefited is not wrong. As long as it's coming from God, you're giving him the credit and glory, and you're keeping yourself in your proper place. So we need to have balance here. Um, you can um, pray for and against it. Lord, if this is not something that's from you, stop it. Shut it down. Show me. If I'm deceived, show me. I don't want to make a mistake. But Lord, if it is your will, let's go. Let's do it. Show me how to do it your way, your will, to your glory. Right? You can get counsel from others. This will be another C that we'll be looking at um, uh, coming up soon. So, in summary, I just want to quickly show you how everything goes back to the relationship. Uh, this is one of the key points of the entire study, right? We have in, in the relationship, we've got to be in the Word. The Word grows you up. We're abiding in the vine of Jesus Christ. And uh, through prayer and the Word, He is the Word. We're abiding in Him and His words in us. We have surrender and repentance. We're asking for His will to be done. That opens or frees us up. Uh, prayer is lining us up. And then we also have worship which is filling us up, right? We need all these components to the relationship. Many people tend to live, as I've said in the past, on the left. They read their Bible and they pray somewhat, but they're not really committing their heart. They're not getting up on the altar like Romans 12, and worship is maybe only on Sundays, and they think it's only singing a song, and you need to be balanced here. You need all components going together. Now, what was our first C? It was consistency, right? So there it is. It's coming from the Word of God. If you're in the Word, you'll be able to look at consistency. Is it consistent with the entirety of Scripture? And you're going to look right for lust and pride. And then the second um, uh, test was character, knowing the character of God. And then the third one was comparing uh, what you're hearing or thinking of doing to the person and teaching of Jesus. Well, look, these are right here in the relationship, aren't they? You know the character and teachings of Jesus from the Word, and you know the character and person of Jesus from your relationship with Him, abiding in Him. Um, he's the vine, you're the branches, right? So you can see that everything goes back to the relationship. And the idea is to look for love and look for rotten and plastic fruit. And then even crop that we studied this week, right? Crop, the fruit, you're going to be a fruit inspector. And, right, we're hoping that we're having love, but we need to look if something could be bring rotten fruit or even plastic fruit. But the key is, is that the fruit comes out of the relationship. The fruit shows what or who you're abiding in. So it's an outflow of the relationship. If you're abiding in the vine, you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit. If you're abiding in the flesh or the things of the world, you're going to have rotten and plastic fruit, a combination of both. So um, this test, again, does go back to the relationship because you can trace it backwards. Uh, fruit reveals its origin. So trace it back. That's it. Have a blessed week.